Hello everyone. In this video, I would like to talk to you about a new way to consistently recover the signal from noisy functional data. This is joint work with uh, myself and my PhD advisor Siegfried Hermann. Now, before we go deeper into this, let's talk briefly about what functional data is and why we even need to recover any signal. In a functional data setting, we believe that the observations that we have stem from some underlying functional form. Recovering this functional form is the goal here, and then the subsequent analysis can take place. What does that mean? Well, usually you don't actually observe functions, you observe a discrete set of points. And we believe that these, set of these discrete sets of points correspond to evaluations of some underlying function over the domain. Usually, you however have to also deal with, me with measurement errors say UT in this instance, that we would like to eliminate to recover this underlying signal. So what we actually have is we have obtained, we have observed YT right here that can be separated into the signal XT evaluated at those P points on the domain plus some error that we would like to get rid of. Now, we don't only have one of those curves, we have multiple from T1 to large T that all stem from the same process. The recovery of this particular signal is what we call pre-processing. And there are numerous ways to accomplish this. The classics include things like B-splines or Fourier splines or kernel regression. But these particular approaches have a downside, which is if you know anything about smoothing, you know that when you smooth a curve, even in a family of curves, you don't take the others into account. So when you obtain the signal for the observations yt, you don't really care about y1 to yt minus 1 at all. And this, we believe, can stem or can cause some systematic bias. This comes from the curve-by-curve -curve smoothing approach that leaves out information. What do I mean by that specifically? Consider this particular setting. We have some sort of signal xt. The signal is a bit more rough. There are two bends in the actual signal, and we have perturbed it by some error, taken the perturbed uh, data and then applied the recovery approaches to it. On the left side, you see the B-spline approach, the classic penalized B-splines, and on the right side, you see our proposed approach. Now, the image here represent the empirical covariance matrices of the residuals of those approaches. And assuming that the errors ut are somewhat well behaved, we expect to see a diagonal form in these covariance matrices here depicted by some heat maps. This you can see is indeed the case for the PC factor approach, the approach that we're proposing, but it cannot be this it cannot be said for the penalized these lines. Here, there is something left at around a third and one half on this diagonal. These points, not coincidentally, coincide with the two bends that I mentioned. So if the signal is rather rough, penalized B-splines, because they're leaving out information in, its, uh, in, their, in their estimation approach, have difficulty obtaining good estimates for such points of roughness. And we're going to talk about an approach that doesn't do that. Like I said, a solution is take the entire sample into consideration when you estimate. One way to do this is by using a factor model. One can show under rather general assumptions that the data that we talked about earlier can be written as an L factor model. So it can be separated into a common component, BFT, and the idiosyncratic component, UT. So signal and the error. Um, if you know anything about factor models, you know that this corresponds essentially to a dimension reduction. So you're reducing this large data set to L driving forces. This has been uh, investigated and established for a long time. So there are many different ways to estimate factor models and many different ones that, that correspond to different settings, really. There are factor models for sparse uh, matrices and so on, for example. We would like to talk about the 
very classic approach of a PCA-based factor model approach for which we have proven consistency and shown that under very general assumptions, in particular, um, not requiring strong smoothness on X, we can show consistency and give convergence rates. What is this estimation procedure? It's really three steps. Step number one is you have to center your Y, which is not that hard. Step number two is a bit more difficult. You need to estimate the one parameter in the model, which is the number of factors. So the dimension that you're reducing to. There are multiple different ways to do this. It's important that you take something that's consistent for the consistency results in our paper to hold. Now, assume you have estimated this number of factors by say a scree plot, if you like, or by cross-validation, or maybe even our own approach. Then what you need to do is you need to find the L hat largest eigenvalues and the associated eigenvectors of the matrix T inverse Y transposed Y. And then you have your signal estimate right here. So X hat can be estimated as such by using these eigenvectors. This is very simple and quite quick. And we can show under very general assumptions that this is a consistent approach. I don't want to go into too much detail. There are some uh, technical assumptions that aren't very restrictive, but necessary in our approach that I will not be discussing. But what I want you to think about are those key things. The noise process has to be IID zero mean and independent of X, makes sense. And here it says it has to be Gaussian, which is not necessary. We've expounded upon this and under certain moment conditions, Gaussianity is no longer required. But what's important is that we have summable autocovariances for this signal, uh, for this noise process U. For the signal itself, we don't need much. We just need it to be zero mean and L4M approximable, which allows for some temporal dependence that uh, comes quite in handy in real life data analysis. Furthermore, we need the curves themselves to define fourth order, fourth order random processes with a continuous covariance kernel. Really, we just need that to use the cohen leuf expansion to, our, uh, to, to help us. Furthermore, we assume that the observations xt lie in some n-dimensional function space, L, remember the number of factors, and L may diverge with t to infinity. Under these circumstances, which are pretty general, we can show consistency and obtain convergence rates in both dimensions P and T, which is key here because for spline smoothing, P being the number of observations per curve is the only thing that matters because spline smoothing doesn't take all of the curves into account. For us, the estimates improve with growing number of observations per curve as well as growing number of curves. I want to just show you this image. This responds to the heat maps that we've shown you earlier. In black, you see the signal that's pretty rough, like I promised, that around a third there's something going on, as well as around one half, and three different methods to recover the signal. In green, you see the factor principal component approach that I just mentioned. In red, the penalized B splines, and in three, a function principal components approach. You see the de facto model seems to be quite adept at recovering those sharp edges, whereas penalized B-splines and even functional principal components have difficulty underestimating before the kink and overestimating after. This is exactly what you saw on those heat maps. What we want to summarize here in total is that we have established a new way to consistently estimate the signal from noisy functional data. This estimate can be recovered in many different ways. Consistency has been established for a principal component type approach, the classic functional model approach. Other approaches may also be used if you wish. We have seen that our idea works quite well, especially for rough data, but also for smooth data and real life data examples. And we can see improvement in the estimation for a growing number observations per curve, as well as a growing number of curves. If you would like to read a little more, here are the names and the links to the two papers that relate to this work. 
we have a theoretical paper at the top and a more application-based work on the bottom, both of them available at Archive. So thanks so much for listening to this video, and I hope to speak to some of you at the conference.